You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We are here in the first week of February, and the weather is glorious. Oh my goodness, this is really nice. In fact, it's so nice, it's becoming a concern. Uh, we're, we're about two weeks ahead of most years, most seasons. Uh, normally, the season will kick off here in northern Arizona, the planting season, middle of February, just after Valentine's. Well, at the farms, where you've got farms up and down the coast from Oregon, Spokane, uh, Utah, Northern California, just different places. We're shipping from Texas and Oklahoma, just all over. Whoever's got the nicest of a certain crop, the nicest evergreens, let's say it's a spruce tree or the nicest fruit trees. We just had a fruit tree delivery order this week, our first of the season. And what's happening at the farms is it's been so warm that the plants are breaking dormancy or we're worried they'll break dormancy. So the bud swell is huge on the flowers, on the fruit trees. Uh, forsythia we got in this week. The forsythias are actually starting to crack and show color. They aren't in bloom yet, but we're concerned. And our goal as a nursery, you know, this is a retail setting, not a farm. So we have got farms out there. We, we flush them out and it's kind of a dirty process. We finish them out and we prune them and we clip them and we fertilize them. And then when they're perfect, when they're ready to show off, we bring them into the retail environment, we show them off here. We merch, well, we want those things shipped while those, they're still dormant so they'll wake up on our cycle, whatever this that elevation is. So here in Prescott, we're at that five to 6,000 foot level. It's, well, I can't say that. We're at four to 6,000 foot level because we get a lot of customers coming over from the Verde Valley, Sedona, Camp Verde, Jerome actually. A lot of container gardens and that kind of stuff. They're coming over. So all the way to Highland Pines and Williams. And we even get customers from Kingman of all places. Driving two hours to get here. So while they're visiting the VA or Trader Joe's or with the other alternatives, ulterior motives. But we see them. So we're bringing these plants in so they'll wake up on this, this central highlands uh, area on our cycle. And so we don't want the plants to be in full bloom, and then we go into a snowstorm or something, and they just woke up too early. And so we, we're trying to ship. We're desperately shipping things early now. So we're, we're the trucks are rolling. It's kind of a soft launch. We don't want to commit too much too early. But fruit trees, when they're dormant, it's a good time to plant a fruit tree. It's perfect. You want to get that in the ground before it blooms, before it leaves out, so it wakes up. And if you get a fruit tree that's, old enough. That is, a fruit tree typically has to be about seven years old before it will actually uh, bloom and fruit. It's got a certain maturity level it has to be at. Well, all of our trees are at least, uh, there are they are of fruiting age. We don't sell whips or immature plants. That's why you go to box stores and these other places. They'll sell the cheaper ones, but it'll be in the ground two, three, four years before it will actually fruit. Here, if you were to put that in the ground, a mature tree in the ground, it would actually blossom and fruit this year. And barring you know the weather and some of those things, it'll actually produce fruit this year. If you wait to put that in the ground after it's blooming or it's already got fruit on it, more than likely that tree or that shrub is going to go into some mild shock and it will shed its fruit or its its foliage or, its, or not its foliage but its its flowers, and so that's transplant shock and it's stressful for plants even the healthiest of plants. You take it out of that container that it's known its entire life, you put it in the ground your yard, and you put it in Arizona, our soil which is so crummy it goes into some transplant some transition shock. It goes well. I don't know about this. I don't. I don't know if I'm going to be happy here or not. I'm, I'm going to wait it out. But if I get too stressed, the first thing I do is shed some of my fruit because I don't want any more stress than I need to. I just don't know. And so it goes into this transplant shock. We've got some tips that help you get past that. But it's best if it wakes up in your yard, going, "Oh, 
what, what just happened? Let's say I went to I went to sleep last uh, October. And now I'm waking up in uh, you know March one. Uh, where, where where am I at? Oh oh look, this is pretty nice. Let's just grow here, and it roots out and keeps growing. That's what you want to work with. You want to work with the environment, not against it. And so the secret is being ahead of the cycle. And so we're trying to ship these plants in before they wake up. Actually, if we bring them in from, let's say, a, a Spokane, who's a, just a couple clicks warmer than we are, uh, then they, they'll wake up and it'll slow them down once they get here. So that they'll actually wake up on our, when, when all the other forsythia, when all the other lilacs or Indian hawthorn or grapes or whatever it is will wake up at that cycle. So I think there's there's no there's no ice on the ground in the ground the ground isn't frozen at least at the lower elevations I don't know about you folks in the White Mountains or Flagstaff some of the, there's I'm sure you've got some frost line but most of us do not and I think as soon as that ground thaws you can start strategizing what I would like to have in my yard and put in a new shade tree or new fruit tree or, or hedgerow or privacy or whatever it is, whatever you have in mind, you can start doing that. Uh, the roses will start shipping here in a couple weeks. Those we do wait on. They're a little bit more sensitive and we just, they'll live, be fine. But if we go real cold too early, so it, can, it can damage some of the canes. So we'll purposely hold back and those things will be leafed out. They'll be really going by the middle of February. They'll just be full on like we're into roses. And then by, what is the cycle on this? Think, I think uh, Cheryl's got a rose manager. She's got um, full on like 700 roses showing, all of them in full bloom, middle of April. So that's kind of, there's cycles for things. Certain crops come into rotation. The first pansies have shown up. Uh, I've got pansy baskets. I've grown uh, some very fancy wave pansies. These are trailing hanging baskets. Just got an update. Just got a photo yesterday. They look magnificent. They're full in the basket. They're starting to drape. Uh, they're starting to bloom. I, we'll pinch them back one more time, then fertilize them, and then we'll bring them in probably next week or the week after. And that'll be the first big push of, of some flower, winter blooming flowers, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the cycle. I want to go deeper this show into for you new to the area, new to this mountain gardening, what are some of those cycles? How do I, when should I be thinking about planting, let's see, vegetables, tomatoes? When should I be thinking about planting fruit trees? And how do I plant? I want to go deep into that. Right now, let me just cover zones. So your zone in for most of us is going to be a zone seven. Now, if you're a little bit higher elevation, you might be a zone six. Or Flagstaff is zone five, Williams is zone five, White Mountains is zone five. Some of you, like uh, uh, the Verde Valley, Sedona, you're zone eight. So that means what that is, that's the USDA, the national zone rating. They look at every elevation, every county in the country, and they give you a zone rating. That is, how cold is it likely to be in that in your neighborhood? If you're zone seven, like my yard is a zone seven, You've, you need to put plants in that can go down to between 0 and 10 degrees. That's a zone 7. A zone 6 is 0 to minus 10 degrees. Zone 5 is you can go crazy cold, minus 20 or 30 degrees, something like that. So that's your zones. So most of us, when you're reading that plant label, you want it to be at least a zone 7 or lower. So a zone five will grow in our area. Let's say my backyard is a zone seven. So I could grow a seven, a six, a five, a four, three, two, one. I cannot grow a zone eight or nine. Those are considered annuals. That is the winter will kill them off. That's going to be your geraniums and petunias, uh, some of your tropical uh, 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 backyard plants like ficus. Those are going to be a zone nine or 10. That's more of a phoenix plant. So it'll grow during the season but in the winter, we're talking about how cold hardy is the plant. How much antifreeze does that plant have in the structure, in the, in the, in the branches and, and, and trunks of that plant? Hole can go down in the winter. So zone seven, that's most of us in the central highland area. That would be from Ash Fork down to Cordes Lakes to Prescott Valley, Prescott, Chino Valley, Paulden. We're zone seven. 
Uh, those of you in the outline areas, it's kind of elevation oriented. Might be one one zone cooler or one zone warmer, but most of us are between about a seven plus or minus one. That's a good way to determine the zones in your backyard. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. (laughs) Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week with your garden questions. Welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. Nice to have you back in country. In country, yes. Yeah. So we flew back from Seoul, Korea. You all folks have not been to Korea before. Seoul is, I don't know, it's kind of where, how do you describe Korea? It's where east meets east is how I think about it. I've been to Japan, <laughs> mm-hmm. been to other parts of, of Asia, and it's kind of this commingling of of Asians with a lot of influence from business folks. From Asians. <laughs> well, it's, main, it's mainly an Asian. Yeah. They love Americans. You know, they, they like they speak pretty good English yeah. in the big city. Mm-hmm. I think one in five people live in Seoul in Korea. One it's in huge, five live huge in city. in Seoul itself. So it's a yeah. huge city. Very much. How would you describe it? I mean, it's metropolis. Overwhelming. <laughs> well, it's like New York or Paris or it any is. other big city. It's just like Atlanta. It's just like yeah. any big city. It's mm-hmm. high fashion, high paced. Very young, like very young. young people. Yeah, yeah. If you love cities, you got to put Seoul on your on your list because they've mm-hmm. got all kinds of. We went to plays and lots of uh, wonderful museums. Yeah, um, just a, really a lot to do there. Yeah. I wish we I wish we could go back and it was spring because I would think spring there would be absolutely gorgeous. Trio. Winter was definitely off season. Yes. Yeah, it was the water wasn't flowing. You can tell they have lots of waterfalls and water. Lots of parks, lots of outdoor. Right. We were right by a Namsung um, a mountain or, mm-hmm. or a park, which is basically Central Park. Huge, right in the center of town. Uh-huh. And then the entire city is goes around this huge yeah. mountain. So we're right at the base. We hiked up that a couple times. Yeah. It's got Seoul Tower right there that mm-hmm. oversees everything, all these restaurants and stuff. It's just yeah. it's a teeming tourist business town. It is. Yeah, it was very interesting to go. We saw some of the palaces there, yeah. and we went up to the DMZ zone and saw that what that was all about. But um, actually, just a very – it really wasn't on our – or at least my bucket list to go to, especially in winter wintertime. Uh, but I'm glad we went. It was very, very good. So why did we go? Why was it on our list? You should share that since you're the mother. Well, we went – so our son James uh, is, got deport, deported <laughs> – our Deploy. son's deported. Deployed, <laughs> folks. He's serving the military as an I, army. <laughs> I, okay. Yeah. I was on a plane all day yesterday, jet lag. Yes. So he got deployed to South Korea. So we went over to go see him for a little yeah. bit. He's right on yeah. the first armored division. Mm-hmm. No engineers. He's the, in charge of bulldozers and creating roads and creating stuff. Well, no, he he's doesn't. the PA that he's the medical guy that's in charge of taking care of that. Right. Division, so he's yeah. he's right on the DMZ. 
right there at the front line. Mm -hmm. So he was able to take a train down to to Seoul and see us a couple times. Yeah. It was very nice. So it was fun. Transportation's super easy. We were in some obscure places. And you can find a subway connection there Mm -hmm. or flag a taxi down from four to five bucks. I'll take you wherever you want to go in the city. And they're, they're everywhere, so you can flag them down instantly mm-hmm. without a wait or any. Even, even the heart of the uh, busiest market, yeah. you can pop out and you go, w- f- wave your hand and three taxis will try to pick you up. It's just really great. It was fun. A lot of yeah. fun. The fish market, that was a hoot. <laughs> How would you describe that one? You were definitely uh, fish out of water on that one. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> I was comfortable, but... <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was huge. I mean, how much square footage... It was just. It was huge. a city block times three stories times with nothing but fish of the day. Catch! It's, it's yeah. one of the largest fish markets on the planet. It, it's a wholesale fish market. Uh, we decided to go in and see what it's all about. It's any kind of fish you could think of, from bluefin tuna to the yeah. smallest snail. They've got it. So we went down and negotiated a fish. Okay, it's crazy because there's. I mean, just row after row, every. Per, every vendor like has their own little thing. Yeah. You tell they're specializing in certain things and fish I've never heard of or yeah. seen before. Yeah. And they're alive. Some are dead. Some they're chopping up right in front of you. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> some they're dragging down the aisle yeah. in boots and you're trying not to be snagged up in it. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, not for the weaker Hilarious. stomach, put it that way, but uh, amazing. So yeah, we walked through there, and then we finally we picked out a fish, which I can't even remember what it was. Do you Rock fish. Rock yeah. fish. Mm-hmm. And then you take it upstairs, and they have all these restaurants upstairs that actually cook it for you. Yeah, they're right, right there. there. I mean, it's fresh as can be. So mm-hmm. they steamed it for us, served it up with some kimchi, yeah. and away we go. Three very, of us good, gobbled down but... with chopsticks right there before your eyes. Yeah. Yep. Quite the experience. It was very, very fun. I'm glad I went. So we went to a play, mm-hmm. oh, uh, no. a tie in play. And then it's one of these interactive, fun comedy, high energy, acrobatic, it's just fun. It's just a fun play. Yeah. Hour and a half long or so. We, we stumble through Seoul trying to find it this obscure <laughs> theater. <laughs> no. Of course, we're one of the only. Americans well, in the crowd. Yeah. Put it this way. I'm the only one with blonde hair yeah. in yeah, the yeah. crowd. So they, they want to bring two people up on stage. And of course, who are they going to hone out? <sighs> Lisa goes up on stage and does this whole act with them. I, <laughs> I thought you were, I thought got, you were going to die. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, it was fun. But yeah. people who it's know me would know that was yeah. something that would Never. just, I want to die inside if I ever have to go. Yeah, they and came and down the aisle. Of course, we're in the premium seats up front, <laughs> so we're t- prime target. So I know we're at high risk, and they start walking down our aisle and start yelling out, no, 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 and they bypass me and go for you. <laughs> I'm going, yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, we should get a question in here. It's good to be yeah, back home. It is. Just long enough time to come back, and but we should do a garden piece on this because it is a garden show, okay, not bye. a travel show. Put Seoul on your list if you love Asia. Mm-hmm. It's well worth it. First world, Definitely. high end, high fashion. If you want to shop, I can see why people go to Paris or New York yeah. or Seoul, Korea to shop because it's everything you could ever have tailored, everything. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. Beautiful. Question okay. for us? Questions. First one is from Danny. They just moved to the Kirkland area okay, all right. and they want to know... Can you probably grow fruit trees there? If so, which we would do best? And when's the best time to plant those? Kirkland, that's big. That, of course, we raised our family in Skull Valley, which is the next little community over. <laughs> it's a big ranch country. Mm-hmm. So they will do wonderfully down there. Big ranches. Usually you're on a well, so unlimited water. That's not a big deal. Our well water was a little high in pH when we were there, so we were registering that nine level. So watch your pH. So measure that if you're down there. But... You should be able to do apples and pears easily. Uh, all the pitted fruits, cherries and peaches and apricots. Make sure that you're growing the higher altitude varieties because you'd be tempted to bring in some desert varieties that would grow down in Phoenix. but the, And they'll grow up in Kirkland, but they won't fruit. So if you want fruit, fruit trees, you need to make sure you get the higher chilling hours. That'd be Alberta peach and... Uh, Mormon apricots and and 
uh, Stella Cherries. You can go down the list. Come, come talk to us. We can help guide guide you. Boy, you're at the peak time for pruning or uh, for pruning and planting <laughs> down in Kirkland. Your peak time. Come talk to us before you do that, though. Make sure you get the right rates and you pair them together. So many of those fruit trees. You need two to make them pollinate each other. And so you've got plenty of property in Kirkland, I'm sure. Just have to put the pairs together. Pardon the pun. Not really pairs, but pairing <laughs> them together <laughs> uh, sh- should be fine. Some other ones. We had tremendous pecan trees, mm-hmm. walnuts, almonds. would also Put that also on your list. Those will grow in Kirkland, whereas they may not grow at the higher elevations of Prescott and the surrounding ridge lines, but they would do wonderfully down there. Up here, we really only grow almonds, the walnuts. We do have some walnuts mm-hmm. that grow up here. Pecans, it'll grow, but again, it gets so chilly, it won't fruit up here. So that's one to also put on your list. And then, uh, what is that? Painted Lady Vineyards down in Skull Valley. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a grapes. They're very famous for their grapes. I think you could grow grapes, raspberries, blackberries, and Kirkland as well. Kirkland's at 4,000 foot level. So that'd be mm-hmm. the same as Camp Verde and Cottonwood, right. Skull Valley, Peoples Valley. Those areas are all in the same, same elevation. But really, it's a zone seven, zone eight down there. So you should easily be able to get plants to thrive and take off down there. Great question this week and good to be home. Thanks, yep. Lisa. Be right back with more on the Mountain Girls. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a styling, drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Again, the theme here with this week's show is gardening for newcomers. If you're new to the area or you just want to up your game, uh, use a few of these tricks and it's really going to make a difference. And, and, And mainly it's how to plant. Here's... Here's a segment, quick segment on how do you put a new tree or shrub or vine or bramble, a new plant into the ground. This is actually physically in the ground, not so much in a raised bed or a container. That's different because now you're bringing in artificial soil. You're you're abandoning your, your native crummy mountain soil. You're going to go, I'm going to bring in my own soil and plant here. That's kind of different. Here, if you've got, if you've got a, a backyard, you're in the pines or in that uh, manzanita layer, that chaparral zone where junipers and, and oak and, and manzanita are, you're going to plant another plant in between there. Here's how you do it. The ground, most of your ground, most of you are planting in a backyard that's been scraped off. So all of the, the topsoil that was there is now gone. So you're going to have to replenish that topsoil cr- or create your own topsoil. If you just take a plant and throw it in your native backyard soil, the plant won't die. It just won't grow. It just sits there going, ah, there's nothing living here. There's no worms. There's no microbes of fungi. There's no organics. There's no nothing here. And so it just sits there. And for years, I mean, tens of years, it will sit there and barely grow. That's an indication you don't have enough organics or there's something going on with the soil. If that's how it's going to grow and you know your, your yard's been scraped off, here's what to do. 
You need to add some organic organic material into your soil back and reintroduce that into your soil so the worms will be attracted. So the, the beneficials, the, the fungi that really help stimulate the root growth of your plant are reactivated. That and some of you are on rock piles. We've got granite layers that go through or boulders underneath the ground. So as you dig that hole, you need to make sure you've got the drainage that's going to be required for that plant to be able to breathe at the root level. Here's what to do. Whatever that bucket size, the, the traditional, let's say we had a hundred five gallon fruit tree show up this week. That's your average size fruit tree. That's a, that's not a whip, not a little tiny thing. It's your average Joe Schmo introductory tree. They go up from there. So 15 gallons, 20 gallons, 45 gallons. These are huge instantaneous trees. We've got everything in between as well. But the average five gallon bucket is about a foot wide around and then about 14 inches deep. Whatever that bucket size is, you want to plant, you want the hole, the planting hole, what you're going to dig is going to be the same depth as that, as the nursery bucket you have at, at the garden center and three times as wide kind of bowl shaped. It's going to look like a cereal bowl when you're all done. So you go down the same depth. Don't go deeper. If you go deeper, the soil gets fluffed up and it, the plant will actually sink as it settles and it'll actually go subterranean. It'll actually, that hole, uh, the planting surface of that plant needs to be the same level or a little bit higher than your surrounding native uh, ground, landscape ground. Don't let it, don't get fooled into the way Phoenix tells you to do it. There they plant it, they want to rain harvest and have things in this divot. We don't want to do that. During the wet cycles we have in July and in March, you can actually drown your plants. We want to be at ground level or a little bit above. This is extremely important for you folks uh, in the Prescott Valley, at 69 Corridor, where it's just heavy clay and caliche, the newer parts of Chino Valley. Uh, the, the, the ground is just hard. That ground is, it absorbs the, the water and doesn't let it go. You need to make sure you got drainage. As you dig this hole, the same depth, three times the width, you want to filter it. Take all the rock and debris and old roots and just weeds. Filter some of that ground. Anything bigger than a golf ball has got to go. You can use smaller particles, uh, some of you are going to have rock chunks. You're going to have boulders. You're going to have all kinds of stuff. I've seen everything over the years. Filter that out. Whatever soil's left over, you need to use that native soil. It needs to get used to, to growing in that native backyard soil. We just want to help it get started. You're going to add some mulch or compost to that native earth that's left over, that's been screened. About 25, maybe 30% mulch to two-thirds native soil, or one shovel's mulch for three shovels of native earth. Blend that all together, and that's what you're going to backfill around that root's plants. So you rough up the bottom of that root ball a little bit. Don't, don't beat it up too much. Just I kind of tickle the feet a little bit, rough up the sides, put it in, the, put it in that planting hole, backfill with that mixture of native earth and, and mulch, and pack it down with my feet. Just as hard as you can, then I water it in. That's how you plant. That's really going to be a game changer because it increases the aeration of the roots, increases the organic matter, which attracts more worms and things, and helps the plant get through that, even the hardest of soils. When I'm all done, I'll sprinkle some fertilizer. I use an all-purpose plant food, 744 fertilizer. I'll sprinkle some of that around, and I'll water it in that first initial watering, especially with some root end growth. It's a rooting hormone. It helps it stimulate root growth. If the ground's not frozen, it'll actually start rooting like right away, right now. Uh, but if it's, if it's still really cold or it's got some ice layers, it might wait a few weeks. But you're right at the leading edge of planting. The planting season It's a good time to introduce, especially some of the bigger trees and shrubs and evergreens into your yard. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so 
blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. And we're back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your, well, with not with anything. It's just all about you, whatever's on the top of mind, gardening-wise. So uh-huh. we're starting to get some shipments in here at the Garden Center. Potteries, got another huge order of pottery, another, uh, some evergreens, some mm-hmm. fruit trees, just things. I saw some pansies came in. All, right. Just that leading edge of spring uh, is, is starting to happen. So we're starting to see some color. The forsythia had some, some color on them. Right. Yeah, well, it's they came exciting. from California, so they're a little ahead. Yeah. So I threw them out in the cold, slow them down. <laughs> that, that's, that's good. That'll certainly do it. So you got your, your good, nice wintry glow to you, fresh My from wintry Korea. Glow, my white pasty <laughs> look. <laughs> and the, no one goes there at winter. We were the only one for real tourists. Not, not only, but no. it was noticeable that it wasn't as touristy as it could have been. Oh, definitely. Um, and it, it was uh, kind of nice in that it was kind of like northern Arizona. So the high was 40, mm-hmm. low was 20. A couple days were, were were bitter cold or you had a nice jacket on. Yes. Other time you had a vest and a scarf and mm-hmm. you're good to go. Right. That's, I love cities that you're, you're walking a lot mm-hmm. in cities, which is kind of nice. We definitely did a lot of walking. <laughs> what was one highlight for you, the ultimate highlight, other than being with your favorite guy? Oh. What would be your favorite highlight? It's a memory, go to, right? Just quick, top of mind. What was your favorite thing about traveling in Korea? Uh, <laughs> there were so many really, really neat things. I think I liked our hiking up uh, Nansen Mountain. Yeah. We did that a couple of times. I just really. I like hiking anyways. And even though it was winter and there was a lot of dormant things, it was still fun to take the trails. Um, What I love about on their trails, you'll be walking along, hiking along, and all of a sudden there's like an outdoor gym. That's true. (laughs) They're big into uh, outdoors, yeah. 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 So it was just really cool to see that. I thought, well, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, saw the old wall of the city. They still have that. Um, you see a portion of that when you're going up on the hike. And yep. That's old. Um, you can see the different types of construction they've done upon the wall. It was just, yep. um, and you get to the very top, you go to the tower. It was just a lot of fun. You go to the tower and then uh, they've got a tram that goes from the city center up to the top of the mountains. Mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty extensive. And so we hiked up and bought a two-way ticket. So <laughs> we want to go down the mountain and then come back up. And they're going, no, Why? stupid English, <laughs> what, American. What, well, no, no, you want a one-way. I'm going, no, I want a two-way. I want to go down. I want to come back up. We just want to see the view. No, no, you want a one-way. I'm going, and we're speaking in a broken English or you know, yeah. I, broken Korean. I'm going, no, two-way, two-way, two, give me, <laughs> okay, here you go. Everyone's giving you the look going, yeah. But we got we that like look hiking. over there, right? We're tourists. We're not business. We're just Having enjoying fun. the day. Yeah. Went up, had lunch up there, come back down. It was just, it was great. It was a great hike. My goodness. That, it's yeah. a pretty high mountain. Of course, the city, the hotel we were at was on top of a hill. Yeah. So anytime we went down, we had to come back up. So we did a it's lot pretty of... Steep. It's a mountain city. Yeah. Very steep grades. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like the steepest hills of San Francisco. Some of those oh, big steep hills. That's what it's made about. The whole city is that way. And I so, would not want to drive a stick car. No, there. stick shift standard. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Yeah. I like professional drivers. I mean, no matter where <laughs> I go. And they drive me Dublin or, or Ireland was dangerous we yeah. didn't drive but you're just stepping off the curb you can be gunned down because your, your brain's, brain's programmed way, yeah. to look the uh, the wrong way mm-hmm. and so there they're driving they're normal driving for us mm-hmm. they drive on the right hand side but still the t- roads can be tight it's, it's congested 
t- have a taxi driver take oh, you. Definitely. A limousine bus took us to the airport. It's I, just- yeah. I would not even want to drive there. It is crazy. It's yeah. like, you know, traffic lights are kind of just a suggestion. Yeah, Maybe you want right. to stop, but don't have to. <laughs> if you can make it through it, go yeah. ahead. What I love about the Korean culture is they are very confident. Mm-hmm. They are not weak minded at all. They know. Not not New York no. They're not belligerent in oh, your no, face. Not at we'll all. tell you what do you know and get, get out the road. Very but polite. they love their horn. They yeah. just go. They walk through. They're gonna go by you if you're not sure. They're just blowing by. They're they they're yeah. it's a busy, congested city and they know what to do. Right. All of Korea seemed to be that way. I'd love that. I know. I know at least twice I got body checked by some <laughs> Korean gal that was probably 90 years you, old. You don't mess with an Asian, no. Asian woman, man. She's going to come. She's coming through. Yeah. She, a couple of them took me out. I was like, holy cow. What happened? There? So what guard advice you got for us? Other well, than you talked advice? about we're starting to get trucks in. And yeah. today I have been first day back and I'm loading fruit trees. I noticed that, yeah. <laughs> so I thought we'd talk about fruit trees. A lot okay. of people come in and new to the area are surprised that we can actually grow a, quite a large number or variety of fruit trees here. Yeah. Um, but they're new and they, they just have questions, you know, and understandably, and I know we teach a seminar, it's probably what, two, three weeks out before the seminar. But if you're new to the area and want to learn fruit trees, that's a great one to go to. But I thought I would just talk about some of the ones that we got in. Okay, good. Uh, and that do really well here. Cause we're, we, we're focused on v- varieties that grow right. here. I mean, mm-hmm. four higher altitudes, not desert varieties. They're longer chill hours. They're going to bloom a little later. They're more likely to produce fruit. Right. So we, we specialize in those, mm-hmm. and that, that's what you brought in. Right. So example of that is one of the nectarines. So nectarines are kind of... It's hard to find a high chill hour nectarine. So right. I really searched when I go look in it. I found one called Arctic Rose, which is a really high chill hour nectarine. So, you know, those are an example of things that we're always looking for, for fruit trees that will do well here. Um, the other one that we bring in is the Nectizy, which is a little dwarf nectarine. But what's so cool about that one is it's so easy to cover. Yeah. And you can cover it so easily in a container. Uh, so that's something that you're more likely to get fruit off of uh, because you can cover it and protect it or it has a high chill hour. We should mention chill hour, just what that means, because we're oh, talking garden idea. lingo. And a non-gardener may not, they're going, what, the, what are you talking about? Chill hour? Never heard of that. I thought I just went to the grocery store and pull, pulled off and <laughs> ate it off the tree. Now, chill hours are pro, uh, certain trees, they're programmed to bloom after a certain amount of cold nights Mm -hmm. in in winter so certain uh, a a desert variety might need 200 nights or 200 chill hours of cold that is below zero below 32 degrees hours and then they'll start to bloom it just takes a little bit of winter and all of a sudden they're blooming well that's perfect for the for the deserts up here we want tree varieties that have a high chill hours that is typically 700 800 a thousand, eleven hundred chill hours. So they're not they're not waking up until April, May before they start to bloom. So that would be you're out of that frost, and that's what chill hours are. Right. So you need some up here that are have a higher chill hour count. Anyway, that's a little bit of detail about what you're talking about. <laughs> what other other varieties you get in? Well, some of the peaches that I was able to find. One is a Polly's white. So if you like a white peach good. that's a good uh, one polly's white is a great one there again has a high chill i think eight or nine hundred hour chill Perfect. hour so great for our area um, but also the reliance and red haven which are, are a good we've had those we carried those Classics. a number of years and they yeah. just re- perform very reliably um, when you get into apricots we always bring in the um chinese is it Chinese Mormon or just Mormon? So Chinese Mormon, confused. they're the same. So yeah. they're, they're interchangeable. So okay. it's a Chinese apricot. Mm-hmm. But then the, the Mormons or, or Latter-day Saints, sorry, folks, introduced them into Utah. And uh-huh. they've just they've kind of taken it over as theirs. Mm-hmm. So it's the Chinese Mormon apricot. Same right. thing. So for apricots here, that's probably one of the most reliable yeah. 
ones. I think Harcourt is the other one that yeah. has a real nice high chill hour. Um, apples, we got an Arkansas black, which is Ooh, actually that one's unusual. a good baking apple. Yeah. Um, of course, Honeycrisp. Everybody loves the Honeycrisp yeah. right now. Granny Smith's. Um, and of course, Yellow Delicious, which Yellow Delicious is nice because it pollinates so many other apple trees. And I think apple trees are probably one people get confused with the most as far as finding the right pollinators for. Yeah. We've got an entire chart that just helps mm-hmm. you with that. Cherries, you get any cherries in? We got some Stellas and some Bings. Okay. Yeah. And what else? Ch- pears? Oh, I found some nice big pears, which okay. Bartlett pears, which last year were like impossible to find. Yeah, good. And that one's so fruitful. So mm-hmm. it's one tree makes it go. Right. Great. So fruit trees that you can grow now, and it's time to time to start putting those in the ground. Grab them while yeah. before we run out, because fruit trees are one of those. There's a certain limited crop, right. and once they're gone, there's no more getting more until the next year's yep. crops are harvested. Thank you, Lisa. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. All right, this has been the show for gardening for newcomers or just new to new to gardening in the mountains of Arizona, trying to up our games. We've covered our zones, how to plant. Right now, I want to cover nutrients, watering, and the pH level, which is so funky here in this part of the Southwest. We have something that no one else in the country has. And so if you're just reading Fine Garden Magazine or Organics or or Home and Home and Home Beautiful, whatever the national magazines are, or HGTV, they're going to tell you, oh, you've got acidic soil. We need to raise the pH to make it more alkaline. And we never, ever want to do that. And there's two things that they tell you to do that are detrimental to your gardens here in the in the Arizona mountain area. One, uh, add lime to your soil. Lime sweetens the soil. Have you heard this? And so it raises the pH where our water is so alkaline. If you simply take the hose off your tap and water your gardens, it's going to be your gardens, your soil will be naturally high in pH. It'll naturally go to seven to eight pH, neutral or the perfect pH. Those of you that have had spas or or hot tubs or, or, or pools, you're always checking your pH. Because if you get in the water and the pH is off, you'll you'll feel like your skin's coming off your body. Or the plants, when the pH gets off, their the roots, the bark wants to come off their roots. And so it affects them the same way. Only they can't get up out of this out of the hot tub and get away from it and go take a shower and hose down. And they have to stay there and live in this. So if the pH is really critical with plants, this the neutral is 6.5, so I'm just quoting the book. I've never seen anyone have that kind of pH in the mountains of Arizona because our water is typically going to be in the 7s, 8s. If you're on a well, I've seen as high as 9.3 pH. The, the pH meter goes from 1 to 10, so 9.3 is virtually, I mean, nothing will live in that. And that's the water. You need to correct that. And so if you add lime, it takes an already high pH and puts it off the charts. Here we want to add soil Sulfur. Sulfur does the opposite of lime. It lowers the pH, makes it more acidic. And so every spring, when I fertilize my entire yard, I add 
the fertilizer, and I also go through and I add a whole other layer of sulfur. So little tiny sulfur pellets. It looks like sulfur. You spread it around. As water hits it, it lowers the pH. It's really a game changer to increase your fragrance. It makes your plants greener, so they're more, they're just less yellow, more green. It makes the fragrance come out. The flowers are bigger and brighter. That's what your pH does for you. That, and there are no real nutrients in your ground. This is very difficult for you folks in the Midwest. You've, gr- you've gardened in Indiana or Illinois or, or anywhere in the Midwest, the South. You just have this rich topsoil that's eight feet deep. We don't have topsoil. And so there's no real organics. That topsoil is what adds or holds your nutrients. Well, you can go through for years and never fertilize if you've got great topsoil. Here, we have none. So what you'll find is you have to fertilize more regularly, more often. And please, for the love love of gardening, stay away from miracle Grow. Please do not introduce that garbage into your yard. It will sterilize your soil. It does more damage than good. In fact, I've stopped selling it. Here at Waters Garden Center, at least, I no longer offer that product at our our garden center. And that's like the number one seller of all garden products. It's easy money. You chuck it on an end cap, it just naturally walks off the shelf. I'm just not going to subject my my gardeners that I help to that kind of detrimental gardening. It's a salt-based fertilizer, and so it raises that pH, it adds salt, it clogs up the soil. It just is not good. What you really want to go for, if you don't have a lot of nutrients naturally occurring in your in your backyard landscape, you want to use a granular fertilizer and you want it to be slow release. Now we go so far as because of what our company, what what Lisa and I stand for, we love organics. We want natural products. We've made our own granular, slow release organic fertilizer. It's a 744 all-purpose food. The main thing is if you're going to go synthetic or chemical-based, make sure it says slow release. Don't just buy a, a, a you know, ammonium sulfate or Scott's turf builder stuff. You're going to do that. Some of those are, are still chemical-based, but they release very quickly, like in 30, 30 days or less. It's all released. You want something that it takes three months, four months, five months to break down and release. If you do that, as as it rains, as it as you irrigate, slowly breaks down and just trickles fruit nutrients through that soil much longer, you'll find you have a much, much healthier plant in the long run by, by using a granular fertilizer. I say on the holidays, you're thinking Easter, that's your spring fertilizer. The 4th of July, that's right before the rainy seasons, that's, that's your summer fertilizing. And then Halloween Almost always, the fall colors around, it's looking good, the maples are red, the aspens have turned gold. That's your cue, fall fertilizer. If you're using a granular food that breaks down slowly, you'll find you have got more apples and you know what to do with more peaches. You've got the greenest evergreens. You've got roses and lilacs that just load up with flowers. Now, you'll have a better looking landscape by doing that. So get a good quality fertilizer. And then for my own gardens, this is my take. This is what I do. For my spring fertilizer, this one you'll probably need to take notes, or I've got a handout here at the garden center. It's free. If, you, if you're driving right now, drive by here, and we'll give you the handout on, on the four steps to proper fertilizing. In the spring, I add soil, sulfur, I already told you why, and the all-purpose plant food. I'll add that usually in the month of March sometime. I'll put that out there. Just a touch early yet. Although the second you see that first forsythia bloom, the daffodils blooming, that's your cue. First bit of growth in spring, fertilize. Uh, Sulfur and food. In the summer, I take the same exact food and I'll add humic acid or they call it humec is the granular name. uh, It just helps stressed out plants. June is so hot, the plants do get stressed out no matter how much you water they just get stressed. And then the rains come in July and everything takes a breath. But what humic does, it actually increases the the root mass. And so if the plants were stressed or they got overwatered or underwatered or you traveled on that Panama Canal cruise and you came back and the system just c- collapsed on you and the plants are all stressed out, um, the humic will actually interact with the roots, encourage larger root mass and now the fertilizer can can that the roots can take up that nutrient. And in the fall, all I do is the the fertilizer. That's it. Uh, I do recommend if you have a lot of evergreens, 
that you do you do a New Year's fertilizing as well because evergreens here they tend to turn yellow in the winter. Um, also, I don't recommend that schedule for your native plants, but your natives do need some care. If you're out in that, some of you bought your lot because of that beautiful pristine pinion pine or juniper or ponderosa grove. If you've got some really nice native plants, they are stressed out. They were growing there for hundreds of years, but that was before your subdivision went in, before you cut some of the roots to put your foundations, your driveways in. The, its environment has been altered, if nothing else, by all the the, the island effect or the, the heating up of that neighborhood, all the asphalt on the roads, the shingles heats up your neighborhood. So now it's living in a neighborhood that's now five degrees warmer than it was used to. And then the drainage has been altered. I would recommend fertilizing your native plants once. And I would use it in the spring of the year. I take that all purpose plant food, that 744 food, and I would fertilize those plants that are natural out there, especially your, your evergreens. They really will benefit from that. If a, a healthy ponderosa pine can take on the Ips beetle or the bark beetle, the uh, a, a ponderosa, a pinion pine that's out there naturally growing, it can take on the scale that shows up if you just keep it healthy. I would also recommend watering those plants, those natives, once a month in the spring, starting at least April, May, and June. I would water it once a month. Take a soaker hose, Soak it around there and just turn it on for half a day. A hydrated native can take on whatever comes its way. Uh, even though you severed some roots, something happened, it can still stay healthy and be viable. Uh, but, but left on its own, they, they're now in a different, different universe and they've got to adjust to that. You can help them easily with just fertilizing and watering periodically just, just in the spring of the season. Those are my tips on nutrients for your landscape. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. You're in the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So I've been coming at you hot and heavy with all these garden tips, kind of pH, nutrients, and how they react. Um, you're, you're coming into the planting season. You can plant trees and shrubs, vines right now and be highly successful. If you're planting now, you will need to water those plants, probably drag a hose out every once in a while, and a couple times a month until whenever it really gets warm in April, and then you're, then you're watering more often. Or when you see your trees finally leafing out, you'll know the crab apples are in full bloom, the red buds are in bloom, uh, the, the, the evergreens are starting to elongate with that new candle growth. You know That's when you're starting to go, I'm in the growing season, I need to water a little more regularly. Right now, you're watering the landscape about once or twice a month. New things especially, a couple times a month. Uh, the, the actual growing season starts in April sometime. You just never know. The lower elevations could be the first part of April. The higher elevations, you know, May 1. But it, it starts right there. We're zone 7, so that means you need plants and go down to about 0 degrees for most of us. 
Uh, so those are some of the inside scoops. I've got some resources here at the Garden Center. They're free for anyone that walks in and asks for them. We've got an entire information, I mean, column basically, with dozens of different handouts. Two I would recommend to you. Uh, one is the top 10 list. It's top 10. I broke down what are the 10 most you know favorite fruit trees, the 10 favorite fall colored trees, the 10 shrubs that grow up hip high, the 10 shrubs that are tall, the 10 most favorite uh, local Arizona, the famous uh, hedgerows, privacy screens. And I've broken down this list. It's two pages in total, but it's the 10 plants. No real detail. It's just a list of plants, top 10 list. It seems to really hone people in quickly. I've got the planting guide that I just went over at the bottom of the hour, uh, just how to plant. I've got an actual one-page handout on that with pictures. It tells you exactly how much mulch and food and, and root and grow, how much, what do you need, and how to plant it, how to stake the tree. Uh, that's free. It's there for you. The other one that I didn't get into, into a lot here is uh, when do you plant vegetables? I could touch it real, real quick. And this is just what is the first and last frost dates? So your last frost date of the season, locals use Mother's Day as the last frost. That first week in, in May, we start putting all of our summer vegetables in. That's tomatoes, cucumbers, geraniums, that kind of stuff. The first frost date, when do you see the first frost of the, of the season? That's typically about Halloween. So the end of, this year it was middle of November, but typically it's about Halloween plus or minus a week. Those are your frost dates. You need to know those things when you plant. If you're from Southern California or Tucson or Palm Springs or, or, or Phoenix, you're going to want to plant too early. You can plant pansies now. No problem. They love the cold, but you wouldn't dare put zinnias in now. You wouldn't dare put petunias in now. They would freeze out. So you want to work with the seasons. So we go into this very deep um, with our garden classes. We've got a Gardening for Newcomers class coming up. Uh, let me stall real quick so we can get to the website. Here we go. Okay, February 9th, Gardening for Newcomers. That's a Saturday from 9.30 to about 10.30. We go into all this and more with a lot of Q&A. This coming weekend, uh, this, this week we've got advanced pruning. Next weekend, Gardening for Newcomers. And after that's controlling gophers and annoying how to deal with javelina and rabbits and deer container gardening goes on watersgardencenter.com the front page you'll see a big class button hit that and it shows you what the dates are you face facebook folks it's got events tab shows all the classes right there they're free come early we had 87 people show up for the uh, wildflower gardening class standing room only might bring your own chair but it's first come first serve very energetic very interactive very timely for local gardening Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center, and we love visiting with garden friends and fans of the show. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, oh, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.